Thank you, preacher. Well, I'm happy to see all the Sunday night Christians here tonight. And uh, I still believe all day Sunday is the Lord's day. And so I want to commend you. It's a great group of people here to study the Word of God tonight. And I'm rejoicing what God did in our hearts this morning and praying that the Holy Spirit of God would have His way with us in this hour. Tonight, we're going to take a little journey. We're going to Corinth tonight. And uh, you might think, my goodness, that's a wicked, worldly place. Yes, but I got good news. The gospel works in Corinth too. Now, we're not going to First and Second Corinthians. No, no, I didn't say the books. We're going to the place tonight. We're going in the book of Acts to Paul's stop in this city that was known for so much carnality. And it's not a negative thing when you get there. It's a very positive thing because you see God is at work. Open your Bible with me, would you please, again to the book of Acts. We were in Acts chapter 16 earlier today looking at Luke and then at Lydia. And we come a couple pages over to Acts chapter number 18 where the apostle Paul makes his next stop and meets not one but two of the great Christians of the New Testament. It's a husband and wife. Tonight we come not to a man or to a woman, but to a man and a woman who both had given themselves to God and each other and to the work of the Lord. And 2,000 years later, we're still talking about them. You ever think about all the people you're going to meet when you get to heaven someday? I'm going to meet these people, and I'm going to say, now I met you in Scripture, but let's sit down here and talk a little while. Tell me more about your journeys with the Apostle Paul and what God did. Tonight, I have a very definite prayer in my heart, and it is this, that God would begin to work deeply in every family in this church family. Now, I love the local church. I said I love the local church. I'm a local church evangelist. I want to help local churches. I'm trying to preach this week in a certain way that I believe God has led me to help this church. But I want you to listen to me very carefully before we read our text. I am convinced if our churches are going to be what God intended them to be, we must begin at home. Now, you can dress up for church and come in, say all the amens and God bless you that you want to. You can string together a bunch of religious cliches and know every word in the hymn book. But if you're not living the Christian life in the privacy of your own home, you are not what God saved you to be. None of us, including the man talking to you right now, is a better Christian than the Christian we are in the privacy of our own home. You know, every week, preacher, people say to me, oh, preacher, we want to see revival. We want to see revival. Well, I'm going to let you in a little secret tonight. Revival doesn't start at the church house. Revival starts at your house. John Owen, the old Puritan pastor, took a pastor in a little village community, and he was just so excited about what God was going to do. And he preached there for six months, and nobody got saved. Six months, nobody got baptized, and nobody got added to the church. Let me testify as a preacher. You preach for six months, and there's no, not so much as a holy grunt. You start wondering what's going on. He first said, Lord, is it me? And then he said in his prayer, the Holy Spirit prompted him to do something he'd never done before. He set appointments with every family in his church. And he didn't ask them to come to him. He went to them. And the agreement was that he would only meet with the family if every member of the family was present. And so old John Owen started visiting in every home. He'd get every member of the family around the dining room table, and he would do two things. The first thing he'd do, he'd go around the table and say, tell me how you got saved. 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 He said the first thing he figured out in a hurry was he had a bunch of lost church members. And sitting in their homes, he led many of them to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he said, bring your family Bible. How many of you remember the old family Bible? Every, every home had them. And they'd bring the big old family Bible, and old Brother Owen would open that family Bible and find a passage of Scripture. And he would not give a sermon. He would just read the Bible to the family. And when he finished reading a portion of Scripture, he'd say, now let us pray. And he'd bow his head, and he prayed by name around the table for every member of the family, for God to work deeply in every heart. 
And when he said amen, he closed the family Bible, slid it across the table to the head of household, and said to that person, now what I've just done for your family, you must do with your family every day. And he established what he called at the time family altars. Do you know he later testified that within six weeks, a spiritual awakening had come to that town that literally turned it upside down. There were so many people getting saved and baptized, you could not even get them in the church building. Would you like to know when it happened? Not when he preached a better sermon, but when the people started living the Christian life at home. And so I bring you to one of the great Christian homes of the Bible. It's found in Acts chapter 18 and verse number 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers." I want you to take your pen out tonight. Matter of fact, before I even get started, find you something to write on. Would you please? Everybody needs something that you can make some notes on tonight. So find you a piece of paper. Or find you the fly leaf of your Bible or something. Borrow something. Steal something if you have to. But get you something to write on, something to write with, because I'm going to give you a list of some things to write down from the Word of God tonight on purpose, because when you leave tonight, I'm going to ask you to do something with your list. So really important that you listen and make your list. I'm going to give you a homework assignment when you leave tonight, all right? Aquila and Priscilla are found in six places in Scripture in four different books of the New Testament. This blows my mind. This man is not a pastor. This man is not an evangelist. These people are not prominent people in some really large church somewhere. Let me tell you who they are. They're just everyday folks who are dealing with lots of difficulty like everybody is, but they had a head-on encounter somewhere with the gospel, and the Lord changed their heart, changed their home, and by the time we meet them in Acts chapter number 18, they have made a friendship with the Apostle Paul. How many of you think that's a good friendship to have? Across the top of your paper, I want you to write this little phrase. Would you please? A Christian home in Corinth. When I say Corinth, immediately people think the most awful, vile things because Corinth was known for lots of wickedness. But here's the good news. You ready for this? God designed the Christian life so you can live it victoriously if nobody else around you is living it. And God made it so right smack dab in the midst of Corinth, you can still have a Christian home. We're living in wicked days. Things are not getting better. They're getting worse, and they're going to get worse because evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. This world is not winding up. This world is winding down. But please don't miss this. God has made it so that you can have a Christian home and see God at work right in the middle of your Corinth. How does that happen? We're going to visit all the places where we find this couple but I want to begin right here where we're introduced to them in Acts chapter number 18. By the way, did you know they're always mentioned together? There's not a single occasion where Aquila's name is mentioned that Priscilla's not mentioned, and not a single time that Priscilla's mentioned that Aquila's not mentioned. My wife is here with me. We've been married almost 27 years and have three beautiful children that all look like their mother, and we have our first granddaughter. If you want to see pictures, i got lots of them to show you after church. And I want to tell you, I, I love being with her, and I love her being with me makes the journey better, and I love this thought that one member of the family was never mentioned without the other member of the family because, look, please, they had decided and made up their mind that they were going to serve God together. And, friends, that is God's design for every one of us. Some of you here tonight, your loved one is with Jesus already, or maybe maybe there's been a breakup in the home, and maybe you've gone through some great tragedy. I want you to know you can't go back and change all of that, and you can't jump ahead to the future to heaven, but here's what you can do. You can start right now, right where you are with whoever's close to you, and say, by the grace of God, we're going to have the kind of home that God wants us to have in the midst of our Corinth. How do you do it? Number one, would you write this down, please? First of all, you've got to see God in your situation. Do you understand they were in a real situation? 
By the way, I'm preaching to some people tonight who are in a situation. I don't know your situation, but we all got one. Look at verse number 1 and 2 again just for a moment. We've got their location, that's Corinth. We've got their occupation, they were tent makers. But right between their location and their occupation is their situation. Put your eyes on verse number 2. Why were they in Corinth? They were not in Corinth on vacation. They were not in Corinth because they found a beautiful house they wanted to live in. They were not in Corinth because business sounded better there. They were not in Corinth because they wanted to be there. They were in Corinth because in A.D. 52, the emperor kicked all the Jews out of Rome, out of Italy, and so they were displaced and dispersed, and they find themselves in this wicked, godless city. I want you to put yourself in their sandals for just a moment and imagine what it would be like to have to leave your home, the place where you love and the people that you love, all the customers that you'd built for your tent-making business and every good thing, and perhaps even the believers you'd grown to fellowship with and love in your hometown, and now you find yourself in a strange place. Oh, hear me tonight, church. God is not bound by geography, and God is not bound by circumstance. God is everywhere, and God is at work in everything. In fact, all through these opening chapters in the book of Acts, the Bible talks about those who were scattered abroad in the dispersion, those that were scattered abroad through the persecution, those that were scattered abroad out of Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria. And I love this thought. Did you know there's two different words in Paul's day for scattered? One of them means to make disappear. Can I tell you, there's a scattering that sin brings And Satan is the devourer. He loves to consume. He wants to make you disappear. He wants your family out of this church. He wants your marriage gone. He wants your kids out of the will of God. He wants this church gone. That is the scattering that sin and Satan does. But there's another scattering, and it's the scattering that God does. The other word for scattering does not mean make disappear. The other word for scattering, I love this, is the word that was used for sowers that went out to sow and scattered their seed. Look, this is not disappear. This is to bring more fruit. This is not death. This is life. So watch this, please. When God was scattering these believers all over the Roman Empire and they were being sent out in every place, God wasn't just displacing them. God was planting the gospel seed in many places. God is not against you. He is for you. And God is not working just for your pleasure. He's working for his own plan. You must see God in your situation. And Aquila and Priscilla having a hard time. But God was at work in that. Some of you right now are in great difficulty. Struggles and stress and strain. And you're wondering, where's the Lord in all of this? Did it ever dawn on you that maybe God actually is the one who allowed that to come into your life because through that, he's doing something out of the ordinary? Did it ever dawn on you that Aquila and Priscilla would have never met Paul if they had stayed where they were? That we wouldn't read about them repeatedly in all of these cities and all of these churches if they just stayed in their comfort zone? God has a way of shaking things loose so he can accomplish his own purpose. But if you're going to have a Christian home in these wicked days, you're going to have to see God and what God is doing right now. Stop bellyaching about it. Too many Eeyore Christians. How many of you remember who Eeyore was? Yes? Now everything's bad. Everything's on the down note. No, brother. You've got to begin to lift your head up, get your eyes back on the Lord, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And so, number one, we must see God in our situation. Number two, would you write this one down, please? You've got to keep yourself under the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. This is very important. See, there is no magic formula to a Christian family, but there are ingredients. Let me repeat what I just said. There is no magic formula, but there are ingredients. Everybody's looking for the equation, you know. There's no magic equation, but there are certain things that you must put in. By the way, your home is not a Christian home because you talk, take all the nasty stuff out. You Look, please, you can take all the nasty stuff out, have a sterile environment and a moral life, and be void of the power of the Spirit of Almighty God. The Christian home is not about what you take out of it. It's about what you put into it. And this is fascinating. But every time somebody was teaching or preaching the Bible, Aquila and Priscilla were there. Look what I'm talking about. We left off in verse number 3. Look at verse 4. They're with Paul, remember? And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. 
They're living with him. They're working with him. And now they're sitting with him in the synagogue while he's teaching and preaching the gospel. That's not all. It wasn't just about Paul. Come to the end of the chapter. We'll come back to this in a moment. Look at verse 26. Another preacher comes to town. His name's Apollos. He was quite an orator. Look at verse 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue whom when Aquila and Priscilla had what? Now, you know what that presupposes? The only way they could hear him is if they were there. Isn't that right? Which means, don't miss this, it didn't matter if Paul was speaking, Apollos was speaking, or somebody else was speaking. Don't miss this. They weren't there to hear the man. They were there to hear from God. You know, Pastor, one of the things that grieves me is to watch how much stock is put in the preacher. Let me just time out a second, a parenthesis. Every week, every week in another church, week after week after week, and somebody says, oh, I hope a preacher really, really preach. May I just say to you, if the preacher gets up and whispers through something, but God speaks, that's what we want. It's not about the antics of the preacher. It's not about the oratory of the preacher. There may be styles that you like better than others. Somebody say, what style do you like? If it's Bible preaching, I like it. Amen. They preach long or short. They preach loud or soft. I, look, that's not the thing. It's not about the personality of the man. It's about the preaching of the word. And I love this. These were people who so loved God, were so hungry for God. They just wanted to be in the place where the word of God was being preached. They wanted God to speak to them. Let me give you a little recommendation. Get over Paul and Apollos and start getting in tune with God. Speak, Lord, for thy servant here. There have been meetings I've been in where somebody was preaching, and they may not have been my favorite preacher. Come on now, how many of you have a favorite preacher? Would you raise your hand, please? Good. Ought to be your pastor, by the way, all right? But you know what I've discovered? It's not always just when the favorite preacher's preaching that God speaks. Sometimes the Lord speaks through unexpected means. Did you know that? And you know what he's looking for? Oh, we come full circle back to where we started today. He's just looking for some people that are wide open to what it is he's trying to say to them. These were people who were there, who were hungry. You know, I don't know why it is, but people start having problems. First thing they do, they start missing church. That is the exact opposite of what you ought to do. People start having problems with their kids. First thing they do, pull them out of the youth group. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Watch this, please. Don't you let your problem be a wedge between you and God. Let it be the prod that drives you nearer to God. Whatever you're dealing with right now, whatever you're dealing with right now, let that thing nudge you a little closer and closer to the Word of God. Read the Bible with your family. Search the Scriptures. Memorize the Bible. Be here when the church doors are open to hear the Word taught and preached. We must keep ourselves under the Word of God. So these people saw God in their situation and kept themselves under the teaching and preaching of the Word. There's a third thing I want you to see in this passage. Write this one down, please. They stayed close to spiritual people. As a matter of fact, look at verse number 18. Remember I said they became friends with Paul? Well, they weren't just fair weather friends. They were friends when things weren't going well. Now there's persecution. Now Paul's on the move. Look at verse 18. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and would you mark this in your Bible? Acts 18, 18, with him. Dear God, give us some people who are with us. With him, Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sincrea, for he had a vow. Can I just tell you, that's not always easy, but it's always essential. You make friends of God's people, and you stay close to the people that help you get closer to God. You, you find somebody, if iron sharpens iron, then you find you somebody to spend time with that doesn't dull you spiritually. They sharpen you spiritually. They, they don't make you want more of the world. They make you want more of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love the fact that Aquila and Priscilla said, fooey on the tent making, fooey on the business. What do we want? We want to be with God's servant, and we want to know God better. Let me just tell you something. There are riches that money cannot buy, and death cannot take away, and thieves cannot steal, and they are found among God's people and in God's word. 
You can have a Christian home in Corinth, but you've got to choose it. It won't be easy. You've got to work at it. And there's going to be difficulty, but you've got to say, by the grace of God, we're going to stick close to spiritual people. Look, for the record, this is not the time to drift away from God and God's people. This is the time to get as close to God and close to the church as you possibly can. There's a fourth thing I want you to see. Come back to the end of the chapter with me, would you please? Look again at verse number 26. They hear Apollos speak. And look at the end of verse 26. They took him unto them. Mm, This is powerful. And expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Somebody said, I can do this one. They straightened the preacher out. Is that what they did? They straightened the preacher out. No. Please get the context. There are things about the gospel Apollos had never even heard. He's given what he knows, but he only knows what he knows. And they have been under the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And I love this. You want to talk about spiritual people. Oh, I love this. Here's a spiritual couple that when they heard this man, they knew this man is sincere. This man really wants to know the truth. But he hasn't heard some of what we've heard. So here's what we're going to do. They didn't embarrass him. They didn't do it in front of everybody. The Bible says they took him unto them. There's a tenderness in that expression. They they said, come on over here just a second. We want to share something with you that somebody shared with us. And they passed on what somebody had put put in them. Write this one down, would you please? Number four, you want to have a Christian home in Corinth? Teach others what you've been taught. You know one of the dangers with talking about family? You can even get selfish talking about your family. After a while, you just want God to bless your marriage and bless your children and bless your home. Friend, God didn't bless you to bless you. God blessed you to make you a blessing. And everything God has put in you, God wants to put through you into the life of somebody else. What you have received, you must now relay we got too many Dead Sea Christians in our churches. All the life-giving things flows into them, but nothing living ever flows out of them. And after a while, excuse me, they become spiritually bloated and sour and cynical and critical and dead because life always becomes death when it is kept to itself. Let's take a vote. How many of you want God's blessing on your family, your kids, your grandkids? Raise your hand, please. Let me tell you how. Find another family and minister to them. The law of sowing and reaping still works in this world. And you know what we need? We need some Christian homes that start developing some other Christian homes and find some other people to invest in. Who are you intentionally seeking to minister to right now? I love the emphasis on discipleship that you're placing right now, making disciples and teaching people. But let's let's get down where we live just a minute. Discipleship can't be done by a handful of people in this church. Discipleship must be a way of life. Here's what it means, Titus 2. It means the older men in this church need to be teaching the younger men in this church. And the older women in this church need to teach the younger women in this church. It must go from generation to generation because that has always been God's way. And where must we start? At home. Begin with your own children. Begin with your grandchildren. Begin with those in your sphere of influence, but say, dear Lord, we want you to use us, and we're going to teach somebody else what we've been taught. There is no telling, Pastor, what a church God has given you, what a, what a congregation, what a flock. But there is no telling what kind of impact could be made for God and the kingdom's sake and the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ if every family just in this congregation would take seriously what God has entrusted to you. We are stewards not just of money and time and talent. We are stewards of the truth of the living God. What are we going to do with it? we got to give it to somebody else. How many of you are glad somebody taught you the truth? Well, we must teach someone else. And so the Christian home at Corinth says we're going to get this to others. Let me give you a fifth thing. Come over with me to Romans chapter 16, would you please? Remember I said they show up in four different books, which I think in itself is fascinating. Because it means they weren't a one and done. They weren't just shooting star Christians. They show up in all these different places consistently. Look at Romans 16 and verse number 3. We'll come back to this chapter tomorrow night if you want to mark it. He says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. Write this one down, would you please? If you really want to have a Christian home in Corinth, then have the kind of home that's happy to be a help. Just happy to be a help. You know, when I read this, honestly, so many things go through my mind. I'm thinking about my dad and mom, honestly, right now. 
dad was a businessman in his 30s. God called him to preach. Pastored the same church for 33 years, and they're my heroes. Celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary last year, and they've been faithful to God and faithful to each other. And, and here's the funny thing about it. They're still happy. <laughs> they're not still just serving the Lord. They're still serving the Lord with gladness. I'd like that. I know too many people who are finishing on the right side, not finishing on the bright side. You know what I mean by that? They believe all the right things, and they're perfectly miserable in it too. Mom and dad still have a good dose of the joy of the Lord. I remember as a boy growing up watching my dad, watching my mother. It was dad that taught me as a boy to give, taught me about tithing, offering. I remember that. It was my dad who first taught me how to witness. He was a businessman at the time, and you know, we just grew up in a kind of home where we showed up to church early and we stayed late and we didn't feel like we were martyrs because of it. That's crazy. But we went to church and, man, we stayed a long time, volunteered for everything, and actually thought it was fun. We got brainwashed. That's what happened to us. I mean, we just thought this is the way it was supposed to be. And I remember Dad going out, knocking on doors and taking me with him and me just standing silently watching him open his Bible and share the gospel with people and lead people to Jesus. And God put something in my heart. It didn't happen in a sermon. It didn't happen at Bible college. Oh, God added to it through lots of other means. But it, God birthed it in my soul through a dad and a mom who loved God and lived with the joy of Jesus Christ. Amen. And they were just happy to help. You know, show you something interesting. Look at that verse just a second. Whose name comes first in Romans 16, verse 3? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Whose name? wonder why. I don't know the answer, by the way. I'm, I, I'm doing what you're not supposed to do, which is raise a question you don't have the answer to. Did you know that they're mentioned six times, three times Aquila's name is first, and three times Priscilla's name is first? I think that's really interesting because actually in that day, the wife's name was rarely ever even mentioned in, in public records, much less mentioned before her husband's. This one's got potential, doesn't it, ladies? Somebody said, what do you think? I think maybe her personality was more standout than his. I think maybe when they walked in the room, she was kind of the outgoing one and maybe the more gifted of the two. How many of you know we're all gifted differently, yes? You ever hear opposites attract? Well, that's, there's a spiritual element in that because we're completers, you see. God puts us together for a reason. I don't know all the reason for this. Here's all I know. All I know is Priscilla and Aquila were known for one thing. No matter who was best known, they were known for one thing. These were his helpers in Christ Jesus. Let me ask you a question. What are you doing here to help the Lord's work? What are you doing? Look, I'm not here just to have another meeting and preach a bunch of sermons. That is not why I came. You know what I pray when I go to a church? Lord, let that church be stronger when the meeting is done. And here's what I know. That only happens when everybody plugs in, finds their place, does their part. I'm telling you, there's some ministries God maybe didn't give you and some ministries maybe you can't do. But let me tell you something all God's children can do. All of us can have the ministry of helps in the local New Testament church. And you know where you cultivate that? At home. Keep reading. Look at the next verse. Verse number four. Who have for my life laid down their own necks. How many of you ever heard that term, put their neck on the line? That's where it comes from right here. He said, look, these people have laid down their own necks. We don't know anything of sacrifice. We, we, we fuss when we are minorly inconvenienced. Most of God's children are whining their way to the rapture right now. Talking about how tough a time we have. Let me just tell you, brother, when you kneel at the nail-pierced feet of Jesus Christ and look to your left and right and see the martyrs kneeling there with you, I don't think you're going to talk about what a difficult time we had with our culture. In the words of the writer of Hebrews, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Maybe, maybe we need to say, Jesus gave everything for us. We're willing to put our very necks on the line for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Keep reading. And he says, unto whom not only I give thanks, they don't miss this, but all the churches of the Gentiles. Now, this, this blows my mind. 
This one couple named Aquila and Priscilla, tin makers, were not just a blessing to their church. He said, I want you to know all of the Gentile churches have been blessed because of this one couple. Let that sink in just a minute. One of the greatest Bible teachers who ever came through our place was a man by the name of Frank Sells. I can still see Frank Sells. He looked like Harry Ironside. He was perfectly bald, and he couldn't stand for long periods of time, so he would sit on our platform and teach the Bible. I can still see him, and he would rub his head and teach the Bible. And one day, my, you know what? I wish if that, if that old fellow was alive, I'd give $1,000, and I mean this, $1,000 to have one afternoon just to ask him Bible questions. He was full of God, full of the Spirit, and full of the Word, and we were too young and dumb to realize what we were listening to. And I still remember the day Frank Sells sitting up there rubbing his head and teaching the Bible. He was teaching through the life of Abraham, and he said this, Have you ever prayed that God would make your family a worldwide blessing? And I thought, ever prayed it? I've never even thought it. And then he said this, Do you think Abram and Sarah had any idea in Ur of the Chaldees that God was going to so do something with their family that through that family the entire world would be blessed? And I'm going to tell you what I'm praying tonight. I'm praying somehow God will do something in Isaac and Morgan and little Presley and God will do something in Lauren and God will do something in Grant that will far exceed what the daddy had in mind, that God would do something for his own glory and bless the world through the family that God has entrusted to us. Now, that's not just for a family. That's for all of our families. Oh, you're not Abraham and Sarah, and you're not Aquila and Priscilla, but you are the people God made you to be, and you are right where God wants you at this moment, and God wants to make your family a worldwide blessing. Do you think it's possible that you could meet souls at the judgment seat who are saved because of your obedience? Do you think it's possible your prayers could go where you could not? Or that God could use one conversation you have to set something in motion for the glory of Jesus Christ? I got a text this afternoon from a number I did not recognize, and it said, many years ago, you led Jeff to the Lord, and today his daughter came to be saved. And I had to say to the person, who am I texting with? Who is this? I don't even remember that man. I don't, I don't remember that family, but I've been chewing on that ever since. Do you think that God could do something, and you don't even know what he's doing, but God is setting something in motion that's bigger and grander and longer than anything you ever imagined? Oh, my friend, there is a God in heaven on his throne with his eye on his children and his ear open to our prayer. Christ is still building his church. The gospel is still the power of God and the salvation, and the Holy Ghost is still at work in this world, but he's looking for some families through whom he can bless this world. I wonder, will you let God use your family? We're not just trying to be happier people, make this world a better place from which everybody else can go to hell. We're saying, dear God, make us the people you saved us to be, the salt and light you left us here to be. Let us have a truly Christian family right in the middle of Corinth. Amen. Write down another one, would you please? Number six. Connect your family to the family of God. You see it in Romans chapter 16. Look at Romans 16. You're there, right? Look at verse number 5. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Sound familiar? Everybody remember this morning, Lydia? We got another one. Come over now to 1 Corinthians just for a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and look at verse number 19. 1 Corinthians 16, 19. This is fascinating. These people lived in Ephesus. These people lived in Rome. These people lived in Corinth. Somebody said, these sound like nomadic people to me. No, these are people that by business or circumstance were moved providentially from place to place. Don't miss this. Every town they lived in, they connected themselves to the local New Testament church. You belong to a great church, but you ought not leave this town and leave this church without knowing that you can connect yourself to another local local like-minded church in another city. Listen to me. It is a bad mistake to make your decision based on business and personal desires and geography and neglect what God is doing in this world through the local New Testament church. Look at 1 Corinthians 16, verse 19. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord. Watch it, please. With the church that is in their house. 
You know what I've learned? I've learned that people don't want the church in their house if the church is not in their heart. Y'all ever have cottage prayer meetings here? You know, back in the day, I preached my first sermon in a cottage prayer meeting. Twelve-year-old boy, Mr. and Miss Logan's house. That's where it was. Mr. Logan was dying of cancer in a hospital bed in the living room. They couldn't get out, go to church, so they took church to them. And I, I stood there, all those senior citizens sitting around the room in a big, in a big horseshoe. It really did look like the Sanhedrin I was preaching to that night. And I preached, and it was pitiful, five or six minutes, bumbled along through something, and they all hugged my neck and told me it was the greatest sermon they'd ever heard in their life. They lied to me. That's what they did, encouraged me. But you know, there's something sweet. I'm not, I'm not recommending we go back to house churches. It was because of persecution. They had to get this way. And for the record, I sure am glad God's given us facilities like this and the freedom to come to them. We should never take that for granted. But I am suggesting there's something good every now and then about opening your home through Christian hospitality to fellowship with other believers and keeping your family connected to the larger family of Almighty God. Nothing is said in Scripture about whether Aquila and Priscilla had children or not, but I guarantee you this, if Aquila and Priscilla had sons and daughters at home, it definitely affected those children that the family gathered in their living room. And I'm going to tell you what we need. We need a generation of children and young people and young adults who grow up thinking not that church is a burden, that it's a blessing, not that it's a drudgery, it's a delight, not that it's something we do on Sunday to check a box and appease our conscience and look like good religious people. It is where we fellowship with the people of God, and it is the greatest thing in all the world to be attached to God's family. This is what it means to have a Christian home in Corinth. Another one right there in 1 Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians 16, 19 again. Encourage other believers. I noticed this just the other day. He said, they salute you much in the Lord. I don't know what that means. It must have meant they said, tell them we really love them. I don't know. They don't just salute you. They salute you much. You know what I think? I think Aquila and Priscilla were encouragers. Dear Lord, give us some more encouragers today. In a world of so much discouragement, in a world of so many naysayers and so much negative talk, I'm going to tell you what we need. We need God's children to start speaking like God's children again. Don't talk in unbelief. Speak in faith. If you've got to run somebody down, run the devil down. He deserves it. But lift up Jesus and edify God's people. You know where that starts? At home. Now, you know what I'm talking about. It's easy in church to use all the spiritual lingo. Let me tell on me. I'm not going to talk to you. Let me tell on me. I'm shocked sometimes how I can go in a church service and preach and pray and praise and sing and worship God and feel so spiritual and get out on the road and in about five minutes get in the flesh. How many of you are with me on that? When your mouth tells on you, doesn't it? Peter, your speech betrays you. I want you to know something. Your children are listening. Those people on the job tomorrow, they're listening. They're wondering if there's any legitimacy to your faith. It's not about what you say at the church house. It's about what comes out of your mouth every other time. Let me tell you what grieves the Holy Spirit. We want to preach on everybody else's sin. Let's get off their sin, get on our sin just a minute. It's not just sins of the flesh. It's sins of the Spirit. The Bible says that it is our words that grieve the Holy Spirit of God. When we say God bless you at church, and get in the car and criticize and fuss and talk about other of God's children. I want you to know God's not in that and God can't bless that. You want a Christian home in Corinth? Make sure you're an encourager of other people. One more and I'll stop. Come to the last mention of them. It's found in Paul's final letter in 2 Timothy chapter 4. That's interesting, isn't it? Matter of fact, it's the last page of his last letter. And they're mentioned one final time. A little different spelling, same name, same couple. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse number 19, he says, Salute, would you mark it, Prissa and Aquila and the household of Vanessa Forrest. Now at a glance, you say, well, it's just their names, preacher. Nothing else there. Oh, oh, there is something here. Do you know that when Paul wrote and mentioned them in 2 Timothy 4, it is 15 years after we first met them in Acts chapter number 18? Do you know what I see here? They were faithful people. 
Some of you people have been around here a long time. I met this dear couple earlier, been in this church 30-some years. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I love that. I, I love to see people not hopping from place to place. They plant themselves somewhere, get rooted in the place, and bear fruit where they are. I love to see that. May I say something to you? What we need more than we've ever needed it, we need some people who are going to be faithful to Jesus, faithful to their family, and faithful to the work of the local New Testament church. We need faithfulness. Longer I live, the older I get, the less impressed I am with some things. The show is meaning less and less. And the people that I have the greatest admiration for are people of substance who've just given themselves to God. They may not be famous, they may not be well-known, and they may not be the most talented people around the place. But you know what they are? They are steady, moving forward for Jesus Christ and faithful all the way to the end. Ponder this just a second. Where will you be 15 years from now? Now, for the record, I hope we're all in heaven. Let's vote on it. How many of you didn't say that? Yes? I sure hope the Lord comes between now and 15 years from now. But, but. If the Lord tears his coming and gives you breath in your body, add 15 to your years right now. Where are you going to be 15 years from now? Can I tell you, you don't choose that 15 years from now. You choose that right now, and you choose that every day. You want to be right with God 15 years from now? Stay right with God today. You want God's blessing on your children and grandchildren 15 years from now? Invest in them today. You want a strong marriage 15 years from now, young couples? Start today to get close to God and close to one another. And by the grace of God, make up your mind, you're going to be a Christian family, even in the midst of Corinth. If Aquila and Priscilla could do it by the grace of God and for the glory of God, so can you. And the Spirit of God will help you do it. My dad, I told you, pastored all those years. In the early days of the church, God really came among us. I remember, pastor, the church was not really a large church, a good church. They'd never had a special day, a big day, like a friend day for the gospel's sake. And, and uh, Dad said, let's try that. We had 604 people show up. I'll never forget it. And up in the mountains there, that was a big deal. People started getting saved and baptized and having to change things in the building. And You know, when God is working, Satan's always fighting. Maybe the devil never fights here, but... My experience has been when the Lord's on the move, the devil always pokes his ugly head up, you know, like whack-a-mole. He just keeps popping up, and he did. Poked his head up in a man in the church. I feel sorry for that man. Saw him not long ago. I feel sorry for that man. I feel sorry for him. I have no ill feeling toward him at all. I feel sorry for him because he's going to meet God someday. Whew. I'll tell you something. I'd hate to meet Jesus someday having been bad to his bride. I'd hate to do that. Yeah, I don't know what happened to him. Got the devil in him, I guess. Started stirring up trouble and problems. Critical. It was awful. It was awful. I remember one night on the, on the parking lot of that church, that man accosted my dad. My dad, it was a Sunday night. My dad had preached his heart out all day long. He was preaching through the book of Nehemiah. I still remember that. And he got in my dad's face and he said, if you ever preach from that book again, he threatened my dad. I was a teenage boy and full of myself. I got out of the car. I was going to whip him in Jesus' name. I thought that was a thing to do, you know. <laughs> Seriously. I still remember my father saying to me, son, you get back in the car. The Lord will take care of this. Amen. And he did. He did take care of it. My dad was having a hard time, preacher. It was the lowest time I've ever seen my dad. He was faithful, working night and day, preaching his heart out, trying to win people to Jesus. I'd sit on the front row and watch him, and I remember him weeping through sermons, just sobbing as he preached. Just trying to keep putting one foot in front of another. I look back down and think, that church would never be going on for the Lord today if he hadn't just kept saying, by the grace of God, my mother right there beside him. But there was a couple in that church, Neely and Francis Mills, that God used. God used them. Neely was a World War II vet. <laughs> he was a tough guy. 
He was up in years. He was a woodworker, had his own wood shop. I can still see his great big old hands. He would stand at the front door. He was a greeter at the front door. And you'd, you'd speak to him when he came in. He was, always, he was always very serious. But you'd say, good to see you, Brother Mills. And he always had that military term, at my post of duty. That's what he'd say, at my post of duty. And he was. And Frances, she made the greatest peanut butter pie on God's earth. Let me tell you, it was wonderful. And Neely and Francis Mills, I don't know why, other than God told them to, decided to make it their business to encourage our family. At the end of meetings, when there was dissension and things going on, I can still see Nina Mills coming up, putting his arms around my dad, hugging him, saying, Preacher, we love you. And God's using you. You just keep preaching. Amen. We're with you. We're with you. They're both in heaven now. I look at that church now, our home church, with all the blessing of God on it, and people being added to the faith, and good things going on for the Lord, and I rejoice and I think those people that most of that congregation don't even know made the difference. I know one thing. They made a difference in my life. I don't know. I really mean this. I, I, was, I was a kid preacher. I was just a kid preacher. I do not know if I would have wanted to have been in the ministry if it wasn't for that couple. One couple made all the difference. And I'm looking around this room tonight, and you've got great people, Pastor, and great families, and a great mixture of young and seasoned and everywhere in between. But I'm saying to you, let God start something in your family. Let God begin something in your marriage. Let God set something in motion with your children and with your grandchildren. Make up your mind. You're going to have a Christian home in Corinth. Don't waste the opportunity that you have. Look, you're going to meet Jesus someday with what you've done with this one God-given opportunity. I mean, you may never be famous like Paul, but you can be used like Aquila and Priscilla. Would you bow your head with me all around this room? Oh, Lord God Almighty, strengthen your people tonight. Holy Father, these are your children. We are your children. Help us. We're in quite a situation right now, Lord, but you know that. You know right where we live. Help us concentrate on the one thing you've given us to do, our own faith and our own families. Our heads are bowed before the Lord. How many of you are glad you're a Christian? Would you raise a hand to God? Would you praise God for it? I must ask, I must ask, is there somebody tonight that say, Preacher, I'm not a Christian? Listen to me now. You can't have a Christian home, not be a Christian. You got to know Jesus. Is there somebody tonight that would say, Preacher, I'm not sure. I really know the Lord is my Savior, but I don't want to be lost. I need Jesus. I need my sins forgiven so I can have a Christian home. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand with mine? Just long enough for me to acknowledge it. Say, Pray for me, Preacher. I, I need to get my salvation settled, my eternal destiny settled tonight. Pray for me. Hold it high just a moment. Anyone like that at all, pray for me. I need to be saved, preacher. I need your prayers. Best I can tell, I'm speaking to believers. So let's get down to it. Let's get to business. I want to speak to all the men first, all the Aquilas. I'm speaking to old men and young men, every man in the room. And I want to ask, how many men here tonight would say, preacher, i got to step up. i gotta, I got to go a little further with the Lord. I've got to be the man God wants me to be. I, I've got to be a better husband and a better father and a better grandfather and a better friend and a better example. I want God to use me. I want to be an Aquila preacher. Count me in on that prayer. Would you raise your hand to God right now? All right? I want you to tell the Lord right now. I mean right now. Talk to him. Your heavenly Father is listening to you right now, sir. Talk to him right now and say to him, Oh, God, make me the man you want me to be. Get everything out of my life that shouldn't be there and put everything in my life that should be there. Talk to him. I want to speak to all the Priscillas for just a moment. 
How many of the good women of this church, young and aged, would say, Preacher, I want to be Priscilla. I want God to use me with the gifts that he has given and the resources and opportunity he has given. I want to make it count. I want to start at home. Preacher, pray I'll be like Priscilla to the end, faithful to God, my husband, and my family, and this church. Would you raise your hand with mine, ladies? All right? You put your hand down. Tell the Lord that right now. God's listening. Talk to him. Pour out your heart to the Lord. Say to God, yes, Lord, I want this. Sign me up. Sign me up. Some of you boys and girls and teenagers and young adults are not yet married. You ought to be praying right now, dear God, help me be that kind of person for the person I'm going to marry someday. And lead me to that kind of person that I can spend the rest of my life with serving God together. Pray that right now. Now, I'd like everybody in the room to lift your head and look at me just a minute. I didn't say amen because we're not done praying. Here's the way we're going to pray tonight. You ready for this? How many of you got family in this room tonight? You have at least one family member in this building. Would you raise your hand, please? In a moment, I'm going to ask you to get with your family. And if you're not with all of them, get to them. I'm going to ask you to get with your family and have a prayer with your family. Listen to me. This ought not be the only prayer you have with your family either. You ought to pray regularly with your family. Sir, your wife needs to hear you pray for her. Ma'am, your husband needs to hear you call his name in prayer. Nothing helps me more than hearing her pray. Does something for me. Your children need to hear you pray over them. I'm going to ask you to have a little family prayer meeting tonight. If one of you wants to lead it or all of you want to pray, that's your business. You want to kneel together, stand together, sit together, doesn't matter to me. I want you to get with your family and pray. Let me ask this. How many of you, like I am most weeks of my life, how many of you are here tonight and you don't have a, another family member in the meeting tonight? Would you raise your hand, please? Okay, but you do because you're a member of the family of God. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you if you're a man here and you don't have a family member here, find you another man somewhere that you can pray with. And if you're a lady, find you another lady that you can pray with and say, pray with me for my family. And I want us to pray. Listen to me. We're going to agree together and concentrate our prayers tonight on this. I want us to pray tonight for our families. You said this morning you want to see God work in your household. How many of you got lost family members that need salvation? How many of you got some prodigals that are away from the Lord? How many of you got something in your family you need direction for right now? All right, pray, brother. Pray, sister. And let's see what God will do through our prayers. Southwide this year, we had an early morning prayer meeting one morning, and I said, let's all pray for somebody by name that needs to be saved. And we all, just all around the room, lots of people praying for salvation. A man grabbed me that night by the arm, <laughs> tears streaming down his face. He said, I got to tell you something. He said, my wife was in that early morning prayer meeting this morning. I said, well, good. He said, we've been praying for our granddaughter. He said, not only is she lost, he said, she's been so cold to us and not interested in spiritual things, and we've been so burdened. And he said, this morning, my wife said, I'm going to pray for her. And she started praying for her, and he said, he started laughing through his tears. He said, while she was praying, in the middle of her prayer, her cell phone vibrated, and she looked down, and it was a text from the granddaughter that said, Grandma, I'm ready to talk to you about knowing Jesus as my Savior. How many of you believe we could be here praying and God could be somewhere else answering the prayer? Do you believe that? Yeah. Then I want you to pray in faith that way tonight. Let's all stand, would you please? And as you stand, find your family and find a place to pray. Do it quickly, would you please? Let's not waste a moment. Don't be hesitant or timid about it. Find you somebody to pray with. Find your family or find a member of the family of God. And if you want to kneel, you want to stand, you want to sit, whatever you want to do, find you somebody to pray with. And all around, let's get to it. Would you start praying just as soon as you get with your family or with your prayer partners? Somebody lead out there. If you want to say a word to your family, do that. But let's spend most of our time just talking to God. Oh, Father, put a spiritual hedge around the families in this room. Strengthen every marriage. Work in the relationships between parents and children. Let there be some spiritual breakthroughs this very week. Let it begin at home. And give us Christian homes in the midst of our Corinth. Help us make a difference right where we are. God, touch Aquila tonight. Help the men be God's men. 
put the strength and courage and conviction of the Lord in them. Help Priscilla be God's woman in the home with the beauty of the Lord God upon her. Oh, Lord, win some victories in our homes this week. And make us people through whom you can not only bless, you can bless others. And I praise you. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said,